This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. We're back from running for U.S. Congress in New York's 4th Congressional District. Tuman didn't win, but got much closer than most expected. Douglas ran on a passion for providing and preserving liberty for all. The same passion that drives Doug and Sunita to run this show. This week, Doug speaks with Mitchell Crowick Thayer, Brandon Goodell, and Adam Corbo on the results of their recent research proposal, Post Quantum Strategies for Monero. Mitchell, Brandon, and Adam discuss their quantum computer research in depth and which crypto is more susceptible to quantum attacks. They identified a variety of vulnerabilities and mitigations that users can employ to protect themselves today. We are thrilled to be back. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Guys, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Hi. How's it going? Good, good. I've been I've been absent from the Monero community for a while. It's, it's nice Same. to be back. Yeah, welcome back. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. It's, it's exciting to be back. So what what did I miss? I've uh, also been absent, so <laughs> with the exception <laughs> of this paper that I've been working on, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. See, I know uh, atomic swaps are on the way, which I think is pretty exciting. That happened uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, what else? We had a protocol update, or not a protocol update, but a network layer update to kind of uh, increase civil resistance. I'm trying to think if there's any other big news from the last couple of weeks. I think bulletproof plus are just still in discussion. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, bulletproofs what? There have been talks about uh, an upgrade to bulletproofs, but I think those are okay. kind of still in the stage of like, is the trade off, you know, trade offs between uh, marginal improvement versus like increased complexity, all of that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I guess uh, no talk of conferences coming back or anything like that, right? Well, uh, I spoke to the, the Europe Monero conference organizers, uh, and my understanding was that. Actually, I guess I haven't spoken with them in months either. It's been crazy. I don't know anything. Um, I, I, my understanding was that they were still going to be being, getting together in Berlin uh, at the end of the year here, uh, like this year. But um, I'm guessing that's not happening, and I haven't found out what the deal is. So okay. do you guys know if it's been pushed back or what? Not sure. We are valuable repositories of knowledge. <laughs> Like everything else in Monero, very secretive, you know, uh, yes. light on the facts. Sure, sure. So uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Um, I guess today we're going we're gonna to talk about the, the quantum research paper, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. so I, I know we had spoken about it five months ago, I guess it was something like five months ago. And I, that was before you guys actually delved into it. So uh, what, what did we discover? What are the discoveries? Uh, well, uh, the primary purpose of this paper was to sort of like tear Monero apart as if we already had access to a quantum computer. What could we do if we had access to scalable commercial quantum computers? Uh, and it turns out that we went through the various list of things in the Monero structure. Uh, we identified a variety of vulnerabilities, a couple of places where we think we're still safe. Uh, we identified a couple of uh, mitigations that the developers can employ and mitigations that users can employ to protect themselves today, uh, stuff like that. And um, overall, uh, it's it's pretty in depth. Um, Adam gave us some of the most uh, insightful comments about quantum computing and quantum hardware. Uh, it was extremely valuable. Adam, do you want to describe any of those? <laughs> well, uh, so Mostly, we, we we basically came up when he's talking about like a scalable quantum computer. We basically kind of came up with uh, you know a, a theoretical 
quantum adversary. And so we're basically in like the preliminary of the technical documentation that we released, um, or when we released, you know, uh, we basically went over like how a theoretical quantum adversary would, what, how we define it and the limits would be and such, and basically use that to probe how it could mostly mess up a lot of Monero security features. But also, mind you, it's this is not exclusive to Monero. Um, this is like and most any other coin as well as you know typical banking systems that don't employ like typical uh, post quantum secure solutions and such. Um, yeah, that's to begin with. I also uh, coded up a couple of like uh, you know versions of a couple of the algorithms that we uh, mentioned in there for uh, use in breaking a couple of Monero security features. So like very that you can actually run on you know. Uh, open source quantum hardware thanks to the IBM quantum experience. <laughs> uh, it's written in Python and QSkin. It's like at the very, that was some of the things that we were working on, yeah. So I know yeah. we talked about, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, one of the most interesting, I'm not sure, Adam just kind of glanced over that just now, but we actually uh, rented out a commercial quantum computer for this paper to develop some numbers just, just to show people what can be done. Uh, and it's it's a very small example of RSA with like very small prime numbers, I believe. Um, but we rented out a quantum computer to do it. So that's out there now, right? Like this isn't some shadowy future adversary. It's somebody who's right around the corner. So who'd you, who'd you rent it from? You, you got to tell us now. I know a guy who knows the guy. No. <laughs> it was uh, IBM QSkit, right? Yeah, the IBM Quantum Experience. Yeah. Did, anyway. did you pay them with Monero? Or did they accept Monero for the uh, for the yeah. rental? It's open source. <laughs> oh, it's open source. Yeah, yeah. Well, but yeah, but the hardware wasn't open source. Where wh whose hardware did we rent for that? It was IBM's hardware. You can basically upload a script and you send it to them, and then they basically have like a, a queue of like scripts that you can run on. Oh. Their but it's like 15 qubits, so it's like really like max, so it's very tiny. But yeah, it's for just like, you know, just running your own little scripts. It's, it's really cool how it's like how open source it is compared to like you know, something like the internet and stuff from the 70s and stuff. Like it's kind of like a similar feel, you know? 56.6 <laughs> kilobods per second. <laughs> so how long has that even been a thing where you can go in and essentially rent a quantum computer to, to run tests? Is this a, a relatively... I mean, IBM IBM Quantum Experience isn't the only um, only service. There's also Gorgetti. Uh, I think Microsoft has one. Like any like names, even Google, I think has some stuff that if you make an account, I think maybe you might have to pay money for Google's quantum computers now. But they have like Bristlecone and like, other uh, quantum computers that you can act. I don't know if Bristlecone is actually accessible, but yeah, basically there's a lot of different companies with a lot of different access to. Google. But this is like this is stuff that you can't demonstrate quantum supremacy yet that's accessible to the public. So you can't like break shores or sorry, you can't, you can't break RSA with shores or something. But you can still like like this one guy was open made an open source game that was like a video game, but it can only be run on a quantum computer, which is interesting. So it's it's like it's kinda like you know those old games where like it's like in the sixties and seventies where like the, the, the asteroid game where it's like run on an analog computer. And they're like shooting asteroids or something, and like somebody did some, something similar, but it's like open source and stuff. So, yeah, th this has been around for four, five years, I think, not that long. Um, open source stuff, at least. Uh, one of the important points, though, is that this. Sorry, Doug, I keep interrupting. No, you. no, no. Uh, one of the important points is that um, uh, up until very recently, quantum hardware was actually faster to simulate on a classical computer than to actually carry out with an actual quantum computer. Um, and so even though these things have been around for a while, they're still toys, right? So. So I know in, you know, when we, when we did the, the last show a few months ago, we talked about kind of the, the differences between Monero and let's say Bitcoin as to, as to which may be more susceptible to quantum attacks. Is there any new insights there as, you know, Monero versus Bitcoin, one being more susceptible than the other, or are they both equally susceptible at the end of the day? I'll, I, I'll let Brandon finish, but I just wanted to bring up something that I wanted to just like share about that, just on, on, as far as like Monero security features. Like, um, for one thing, the uh, 
proof of work, ran, uh, random, I don't forget what it's called, but that, that's actually like far more secure to quantum adversaries than uh, what Bitcoin uses as a proof of work. So that was just something that I found like right off the bat was very clear security advantage um, to quantum adversaries. But anyway, Brandon mostly probably a lot more on that. Uh, yeah, random X, like Adam just mentioned, it seems to be a pretty devilish algorithm uh, for proof of work uh, using Mitchell's words. Um, so uh, that seems to be like that, that'll be okay. Now keep, keep in mind though, that um, uh, for Monero, for random X, they weren't just going for post quantum secure because they were using, I mean, we were using the SHA-3 KeyCAC hash or Kekik, Kekik. I ran a poll on Twitter about how to pronounce KeyCAC, and I don't remember the results. But um, <clears throat> that's a post-quantum secure hash function, but it's not ASIC resistant, right? And so it wasn't just the post-quantum security for RandomX that um, is, is beneficial. Um, but one of the things that we found is that the stealth addresses in Monero are rather protective of the overall key structure um, so we, we discover, I mean, like if you go through the list of, of things that you, you need to run a trans transaction protocol on a de decentralized network, you have things like key generation and it's like, oh, we're in the discrete log setting. So a public key means that you can extract a private key, which means posting public keys is dangerous. Great. Okay. And then you go down the list, right? And you're like ring signatures. Okay. I can break a key image the same way I can break a key and, and then identify the true ring member. Okay. So there goes ring signatures. Um, and since keys are exposable, then people can just sign signatures at will. Right. So like, what does that even mean? Um, but then you go through the list and you're like, ah, but then you have these one-time stealth addresses that Monero has. And it seems from what we've looked at that, there's not much that even a quantum computer could do because they're basically perfectly hiding. Um, there is a caveat to that, which is that quantum computers that can hash in the quantum random oracle model instead of just the normal random oracle model, they can make exponential number of queries all at once. I mean, they really just make one query, but they can pack an exponential number of like inputs into that query and then get a little bit of information from each input. And then they can try to reconstruct the hashes of those from a fewer queries. So in the quantum random Oracle model, things are sort of like an open question, but it seems to us like the stealth addresses are secure in Monero, which is great. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that sounds like kind of big news, right? In terms of this, this race for security in, in Monero mm -hmm. versus Bitcoin. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, this allows, uh, this allows you basically some, somebody can now keep like a secret wallet that every time that you never let anybody send to except yourself and you keep that public key actually secret. Right. And then from that secret wallet, you can spend out of that like normal. Mm -hmm. And that does an enormous amount for uh, destroying the key infrastructure problem that I described earlier, um, because as soon as you post the public key, somebody can rip the pub private key out of it and then construct a fake signature, or it's actually a real signature at that point, right? So there's a couple of little mitigation procedures that users can do, and there's um, some low-hanging fruit that the developers can do to protect the money supply long-term against quantum attackers. Um, Fluffy Pony and I have talked several times about switch commitments in the past. Um, uh, these are uh, everlastingly binding in the sense that they act just like our normal commitments now until quantum computers arrive or we get nervous about it and we turn on this extra functionality. And they're only a little bit bigger than our current uh, um, commitments. So it's like really, really low hanging fruit to secure the money supply. So there's actually like a, a bunch of really like nice results that are coming out of this. Um, it's just piled on top a mountain of discrete logarithm stuff that just collapses in the presence of a quantum computer. Quantum gravity. We can call it quantum gravity. <laughs> so would would this be like kind of an accurate uh, accurate recap? Oh, sorry. It's off the string theorist, Brandon. <laughs> sorry, it's physics joke. Um, so uh, just to kind of like ask for details around that. So with the switch commitments, the situation that we are in today is that if all of a sudden 
an article breaks that, oh, somebody has a quantum computer that is practical. We will never ever know if the Monero supply has been inflated. Like once we hear that that computer exists, it's over, end game. There's no going back. And so the notion is we can proactively add these switch commitments. And if we never hear about quantum computers, we didn't gain anything, we didn't lose anything. If we hear about them and we've added the commitments in advance, then that's our like ace up the sleeve to like stop any shenanigans. Would that be an accurate kind of description? Yeah. Yep. And then Perfect. so what 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 is the the some of the obvious hesitations as to why we wouldn't add them? Just inefficiencies, I assume. Oh yeah. Um, the, every time we bring something up like this, uh, the question becomes whether or not it's going to be too burdensome for the improved security, especially in the safe sense situation where you have this qualitative notion of security, right? <clears throat> it's like about the whole blockchain. Uh, you can define specific security properties, but in the end, like this is a big complicated system and like just coming up with even like a, a volume of security properties, it's not really going to be like what you need to know. Um, in the end, uh, people are like, okay, so how big are the switch commitments? And how long is it going to take to verify? And how long is it going to take to verify the whole blockchain five years from now? So on and so forth. Switch commitments are, are exactly 32 bytes larger than our current commitments. And they have very little additional overhead. So the overhead is extremely measurable for like, or the cost is extremely measurable for like before and after. It's a very easy analytical situation. Um, I think most of the pushback against switch commitments over the past couple of years has just come from inertia um, in the development community. People have been busy with other things. We've been busy with like making bulletproofs more efficient and fast and things like that. Um, at least this is the situation over the past several years, right? Like I. I've been out of the Monero, Monero community for most of this year because of health reasons. And so I'm, I'm a little bit like looking backwards here. Um, but I think most of it has to just to do with other things being higher priority, especially because the quantum computer is this scary boogeyman on the horizon that we don't have this definite timeline for. Yeah, one of the tricky things is like, if you include quantum computers in your threat model, then switch commitments are a no-brainer but there's always going to be some minority of the community that like refuses to accept quantum computers as part of their threat model and so that can kind of lead to a little bit of like uphill stuff but hopefully given that it's like such a small change and such small overhead um hopefully switch commitments won't be as controversial it's it's it seems that i, I from what i'm hearing i i would certainly be on board uh from what i'm hearing thus far obviously we got to see more um but it's, it seems like a no brainer that we'd wanna move in that direction as quickly as possible. Uh, and it would just, I feel like bring uh, positive attention to, the, to, to, to Monero as being on the forefront there of, mm -hmm. of an inevitability. Adam, you, you have a very good, uh, or better than I would say most, right? On the feel of how quickly quantum computing can possibly progress. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not gonna give any like definite like estimates because no matter what i say like if, if i say like 2030 or something they're like, gonna be 2030 and they're gonna be like hi he was wrong you know <laughs> but i mean i can definitely give like you know like like data and, and such that would like show I, and i mean to answer the the question of like whether you should consider quantum computers seriously in your security model um i i think to the most part they're inevitable someday uh like that's that's kind of like a definite uh, thing, but I mean, to answer some of the skepticism, let's like actually be like really skeptic here right now about like quantum computers and like what are their capabilities and like are they should they, will they actually exist? And I mean, like one of the questions is like uh, like decoherence, for instance, like uh, like when you're building a quantum computer, is it possible that like the fault tolerance threshold in practice might prevent implementation that would like break cryptography and stuff? And so and other theoretical questions. Um, that 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 could be a, a theoretical hurdle that like might be possible that it like never will be surpassed. And then another thing is that maybe like pra actual practical quantum computing once they reach a certain qubit limit, like it's like it's it, it actually breaks fundamental physics or something like that, and like it it, it, it works in a way that's completely unpredictable. Those are like two. Those are, would probably I'd say would be like the two valid points of skepticism as to like the development of quantum computing that would exist today. But I'd say 
maybe once you once somebody announces that they've achieved quantum supremacy on like 120 qubit hardware then I think for the most part, I think even like skeptics with those two valid points would probably be pretty assuaged. Two un invalid points, I'd say, would be something like, you know, like uh, quantum computing must be impossible because it violates the extended church Turing thesis. And like, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, people just say it works this way, but you know, when we actually do, I mean, it's kind of the same thing as the other earlier point of skepticism. Um, and I, <laughs> uh, and also another one is like, oh, quantum computers are just fancy analog computers or like something else, you know? Um, and th those I'd say are a bit more like, they're not quantum computers, sorry, they're not analog computers. That's definitely true with the threshold theorem and like, uh, you know, uh, quantum fault tolerance, it's kind of destroys the argument that quantum computers are just, you know, fancy analog computers. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you really want to get really ridiculous and out of the woods with skepticism, you can go into like the holographic principle and like it violates, you know, it's bit storage in a volume and that if you have a, a, a sufficient enough like quantum computer, like uh, and enough qubits, it'll just collapse into a black hole theoretically or something because of like bit storage in a volume or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen if you, <laughs> if you build a quantum computer. But to there, there are question, definitely some conspiracy theory skeptics, skeptics about quantum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's one of the reasons that we want to emphasize, like, we rented one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we've rented one. We've, we've, we've done I, – I, I've, I've, I've written the code in Python that can be run on a Python library on Qskit, and you can run these algorithms yourself from our technical documentation. Uh, but anyways, really to answer your question past all the, you know, answering, the, hopefully this answers some skeptics, like, uh, you know, fears, uncertainty and doubts and such, uh, when it'll, I mean, just this year during this audit, <laughs> during this audit, in the time between the first interview and now there's been at least another billion dollars, uh, allocated by the U S U S Congress into quantum computing research. And, uh, I think the Chinese government also put in 10 billion and, other governments are also doing the same. So there's a lot of national interest in developing quantum computers worldwide. And, you know, like you throw enough money at a problem, you're going to get something. <laughs> you know? So uh, I, 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 that definitely is going to incentivize a lot of research into quantum computing. And so I wouldn't be, and, and actually just a few weeks ago, IBM released like a timeline that they'd have a thousand qubit quantum computer by 2023. I mean, I'd have to see whether they can make the first milestone of like 127 qubits or something like that before, like, I'd see if they could actually make that timeline. But like, once you get to a thousand qubits, you're reaching, you're getting pretty, pretty close to being able to break RSA and ECC quickly if you're able to actually like implement them with fault tolerance and such. So that's pretty close, 2023. But I wouldn't say that that's when quantum computers will be able to break ECC and RSA. So I, I mean, by end of the decade, I definitely like try to preach to, to, to change encryption protocols before the end of the decade by far, if not like 2025 and even earlier, potentially. But it's, it's an inevitable thing that seems to be kind of swiftly approaching faster than some people might think or maybe longer than some people might think. But anyways, don't quote me on exact dates. Just well, well, I ordered that because uh, I went back and listened to our interview from last time in preparation for this. I just finished listening to it. And I ordered that Scott Erickson book that you recommended because I, I hadn't had time when I was running for Congress, but now very excited to sit down and read that. I'm looking nice. forward to it. And I got to say, by the way, very much enjoying this conversation, guys. Uh, I've been, I was on that campaign trail and this is, this is so refreshing to be <laughs> talking to you guys doing doing God's work here, whatever it is you guys are doing. I don't, know, I don't know where you guys get these brains. Um, so just want to mention that very, refreshing. that's great to have you back in the fold. Yeah. Um, so Adam, another, so another question. So, cause I think when we spoke last time, you know, I had asked you, are you a Monero guy that, you know, also happens to be into quantum, uh, computing or are you a quantum computing guy that's entering the crypto sphere now? And, uh, I think it was that you're a quantum computing guy that's started to get involved over these last few months through this research that you've done on Monero. Do you have any new opinions on, on the Monero project itself and, you know, maybe versus other ones, have you been looking into crypto on a deeper level? 
yeah, I mean, I've looked into a couple of other projects, certainly. And um, I mean, comparing it with Monero, but I mean, predominantly most of like the, the work was like very in depth looking at the mechanisms that, you know, make up the security of Monero and, you know, probing for weaknesses. And me and Brandon did a lot of the, the work in like just like the math, obviously. And mm -hmm. Mitchell was definitely a great help in like organizing everything and getting all that together. And um, I mean, uh, I'd say Monero is definitely a very fancy beast <laughs> in terms of <laughs> uh, in terms of just like the underlying under the hood mathematics and security mechanisms that they employ, and it seems that they definitely uh, a lot of the talent behind uh, making it better and improving it through not only uh, the community funding and such is definitely like a big plus for them. It seems. Uh, I mean, I definitely. Uh, learned a lot about cryptography since we last spoke. Uh, I, I, I wasn't like, I like, I wasn't completely new to it, but I, I, I know a lot more about it now. And so I, I'd say I'm kind of like a bit half and half, you know, like I, I predominantly, I, I know more about quantum computers than most people in this space, I'd say, but at the same time, I, I, I know a lot more about like how the different cryptocurrencies and Mechanisms. I feel bad because I feel like I'm constantly dragging Adam through this like mathy forest and just like watch the branch, bam! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love the math. The math is uh, exciting. It's you know beautiful. It's the the most beautiful one of the most beautiful art forms humans have made. I guess I don't know. <laughs> So do you guys want to go through a little bit of, you know, uh, specific, uh, I guess we spoke about some of them, but any other specific aspects or mechanisms in, in Monero where you kind of did this analysis and looked at how it would be potentially affected by uh, quantum computing? Sure. Well, let me recap uh, basically piece by piece what I've said so far, because I dumped a lot of information. And some of this comes with uh, some like recommendations for users anyway, at least for keys. So first off, if a quantum computer exists, then the way that keys are computed in Monero itself is insecure. And posting a public key is dangerous. And it's not dangerous today, but it will be dangerous later. Somebody will be able to scrape old Monero keys off the internet in the year 2000 N and retroactively pull the private keys out of those things. And if they don't have any, or if they have any funds remaining in them, they can then just spend them at will. They don't need to bother trying to make a forgery or anything like that. They can just extract the keys. So the, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I was just gonna jump in with a real quick note that a Monero address is just like a network byte your public view key and your public spend key, and then a checksum. So when we say post your keys or have your keys, that means your Monero address. The thing starts with a four, starts with an eight. If that is posted publicly, the keys are literally in that. And so we can pull the private keys out of that. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. That's the, I hope you guys interrupt, especially if I gloss over stuff. So the way just that you- to, Just to interrupt oh. one point there as well, but the simplest solution there is you're just obviously either not posting or you're just sending off to a fresh address and then you're right. Essentially you have to start treating wallet addresses like one-time addresses or at least the ones that you post publicly. Right. So yeah. you would kind of just have to generate a lot of wallets for when you're receiving funds from people, but you would have this one secret wallet as I described earlier that you can then send all that money to so that later if somebody scrapes those keys, they're empty and you can use your secret wallet to construct transactions and you're still fine. Okay. So um, this sort of makes it a pain in the butt for generating a lot of wallets and it sort of defeats the purpose of the one-time addresses. It seems like it defeats the purpose of the one-time addresses. Um, but we'll get back to that in a second. Okay. So first, first things first, posting your public wallet address is a bit sketchy right now, or at least it will be eventually be sketchy. And so you shouldn't allow a public address to remain in public if it has any money, or rather you shouldn't allow any money to remain on a public address that's been public. Okay, that's keys. Can I jump so, in with one more thing? Yes. Also, sorry, maybe this was clear, uh, that once someone takes the address 
and extracts your private key, that's like equivalent to having your 12, 13, or 24 word, 25 word seed. So that's how, that's how I can literally take the address, extract the seed, and then just spin the whole thing up myself, spend it, whatever. So even if I post a public address and the funds are moved out of it, if someone has scraped that 10 years from now, they could just boot up a wallet with that and still see the entire transaction history of that address. Sorry, yep. go ahead. It's wonderful. Um, okay, so that's the keys. Uh, the next thing up would be ring signatures. And in that case, these key images can be broken, like I said before, and then the member of the ring that was used to construct the ring signature can easily be identified. So this takes the spender ambiguity nature of ring signatures of like, oh, I spent out of these 11 keys and each of those 11 keys spent out of these 11 keys. It just reduces it to a line. So it throws away all of that benefit of ring signatures. Um, there is one mitigation for that, and that would be moving to a post quantum ring signature scheme. And that would also fix the key problem from the previous statement. Unfortunately, post quantum ring signature schemes right now are humongous. They are so large and they take so long to verify that even the most practical ones, um, it would be hard to convince the skeptical members of the Monero community that it is efficient enough for usage in practice. So we're still waiting on good lattice or good post quantum ring signatures. Um, so that doesn't really have like a mitigation yet, but if we keep an eye on the situation, then the situation might change. Okay, so there's a lot of very rapid advancements in post quantum crypto. So even between the five months when we spoke and now there have been like NIST competitions for post quantum cryptography. There's all kinds of new contenders and variants of those. Uh, the field of post quantum cryptography is moving as fast, I would say, as the field of quantum computing. I mean, apples and oranges. Um, but it's really exciting just to kind of be plugged in and kind of watch as all this stuff comes out. And key sizes are going down, verification times are going down. Like it's a little clunky now, but uh, the progress is just amazing. Yeah, I'd say, uh, I mean, from our initial foray into post quantum cryptography for this project, uh, I mean, yeah, there's been a lot released since we started. Um, and it seems like there's definitely some practical implementations out there that we included in the technical documentation. But like like Brandon said, like the verification time for ring signatures is absurd right now. But it seems that, I mean, if, if you seriously want to have a contender to replace Monero, I'd probably realistically wait like a few months before like looking at and see how the field evolves. But definitely keep the ear to the ground. Yeah. Yep. If, if uh, there's a bunch of different post quantum settings, um, and some of them are faster and smaller than others. And for example, if somebody came up with a good linkable ring signature scheme for multivariate rings or multivariate cryptography, um, or uh, something along those lines, we we could have quite a uh, quite a competitive thing going on. Um, but right now, it's just the math isn't there yet, and that would involve many more months of research. Um, okay, so we did keys and we did ring signatures. Uh, ring confidential transactions. I'm not going to talk about range proofs because um, I'm pretty sure that, okay, so look, the range proofs in Monero are built into our bulletproofs proving system. And I'm not totally confident about the post quantum security of the bulletproof proving system because it's based on the discrete logarithm. However, um, it's possible that uh, there are some components of the way that the bulletproof protocol are designed that are more resistant to just taking discrete logarithms. So it's possible that our range proofs are actually okay. But um, we didn't go that far into those because it seemed um, far off of the core uh, couple of components of Monero. Now, hidden amounts, on the other hand, um, transaction amounts in Monero are hidden with Peterson commitments, and we already discussed the switch commitments as a possible option. Now, what's really interesting is that it, because Peterson commitments are perfectly hiding, I use the word perfectly in the mathematical sense, not in like some app, like qualitative um, sense, but they, they're information theoretically hiding. You cannot guess um, up to the quality of your random number generator. You can't guess what's, what's being hidden in those uh, amounts. So um, even against a quantum computer, Monero's amounts are opaque. 
cool, right? Except we do know that we can mint money if we have a quantum computer. Right. And in that case, we can harm the money supply. And because it's perfectly hidden, this is what Monero or uh, Mitchell was bringing up earlier about Monero. Because it's perfectly hidden, you wouldn't be able to detect that it had happened. So for Peterson commitments, we're like, oh, OK, we have perfect hiding, but we only have computational binding. And this allows us it, computational anything in the cryptography world means it's vulnerable to a, a, a quantum computer. And so that means that somebody will be able to manipulate the money supply. And so now we have a problem because and you may be familiar with this already, Doug. I know a lot of people in your audience are. But when you're talking about commitments, you have this trade off between hiding and binding. And you can't get away from it. It's again, it's a theoretic thing. It's like provable. It's as true as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And so uh, you have to decide, do we want money that cannot you cannot see the amounts for? Or do we want money that you cannot manipulate the supply for? And the answer is over here is not money. Because if the money supply can be manipulated, it doesn't matter if it's opaque. So the only answer is that you have to make it so that the money supply is, in, is secure against quantum computers. And the way we, we're proposing to do that is switch commitments. Um, let's see here. We did keys. We did ring signatures. We I, did, I have a question about that. Yeah. So uh, in the case is that if we add these switch commitments, they are in addition to what is currently there. And so if quantum computers never show up, nothing changes, everything is continuing just to be hiding, all of that, the switch commitments are just like an escape button if a quantum computer shows up that we can like hit the hatch and then we have this uh, binding term. Yeah, so it'll be opaque until we hit the escape hatch uh, lever or whatever, and then we'll have a secure supply, but not necessarily opaque. And it's still worth noting that it will still be a lot of computational resources to violate that, to, to look in, to, to see how much is being stored um, because you still need to apply the quantum computer to look at the amounts, right? So um, what once uh, in switch commitments. So like, it's still gonna be a pain in the butt to track amounts in the Monero ledger, even with switch commitments, even though they're not perfectly resistant to quantum computers anymore. Yeah, wait, just, just to back up to make sure I fully. So when we yeah. do, if we do switch to switch commitments, so that, that trade-off still exists, obviously, because mathematically that trade-off always exists. Um, but then you're saying, so at that point we're saying, now we want to be perfectly binding and we're okay with the fact that a quantum computer could potentially uh, you know, reveal the blinding part. That's, un that's the unfortunate trade-off that we have to work with, yep. And switch commitments are basically the short of using post-quantum uh, uh, commitment structures. Nope. Even if you use a post quantum scheme, right, you still have this trade off. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's no way out of this dilemma except for something like a switch commitment, which is actually a brilliant invention by Tim Ruffing, who's uh, written several papers in the cryptography world that Monero has 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 benefited from so uh, i want to thank tim ruffing for coming up with that and his co-authors there were several if i recall correctly there was more than one co-author but i forgot their co-authors because tim was on the list hmm. that's interesting so would 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 uh you know so in this post quantum world and let's say monero had upgraded to switch commitments uh what would that then potentially look like? Would there still be a way to kind of obscure your your amounts and you know um, sending it so, to? It just wouldn't be as obscure as it is today. Uh, it would not be as obscured as as well. It would be as obscured as it is today for classical attackers. Right. So um, the hacker in the basement down the street who doesn't have the resources to rent a quantum computer still won't be able to see your transaction amounts and steal your identity. Um, but you'll end up with something like large scale actors having the funds to be able to look at amounts. So there might be some other things that we can do to deal with this. And um, this goes back to pre ring CT days. So this is like 2014 or something like that. Like I remember talking with Fluffy Pony about this. We were, we were trying to decide whether or not it would be worth uh, um, 
coming up with some optimal distribution of denominations of outputs so that you can't just make an arbitrary amount output. You have to like, just like, I can't give you like 1.7 pennies. I have to give you a certain number of quarters and a certain number of dimes and so on. It's possible that if you pick a correct distribution of those outputs that you might be able to obscure the actual incoming inputs and outputs and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of little tricks like that, but Mitchell's nodding, but he's also a he's also a data scientist and he knows exactly how insecure that approach would be, right? So um, the short answer I think is um, on the longest timeline, uh, the best way that we might be able to protect against transaction amount peeping would be something with like really, really large keys, which is, it, it just make it so big that even the quantum computers that in, in our biggest, like most ideal dreams, couldn't crack it in the time of 11 copies of the universe. If we did something like that, then yeah, sure, who cares? But we could do that with classical stuff before and not even consider the quantum computer and just like double the key lengths, right? So um, uh, short answer is I'm pessimistic, but optimistic. <laughs> It's, it's probably worth noting that in our quantum adversary model, there were uh, two or three main algorithms that were used. Uh, one of them is called Shores, which can be used for factoring large numbers or breaking the discrete log problem. Uh, another one is called Grover's algorithm, which can be used kind of for black box functions. Each of those scales differently. And some of them, uh, like with Grover's algorithm, if you run into a problem, you can kind of kick the can down uh, down the road by like doubling key size, but that doesn't work for shores, right? So you need to be sensitive about what the mechanism is, uh, we know what the quantum mechanism is, and then like which approaches are viable. Is that right, Adam? Yeah, if, if, you're, if you're doubling uh, ECC key links, um, that's still going to be vulnerable to shores, but if you, I mean, if you have something that's somehow vulnerable to brokers, but not, you know, a classical search algorithm, um, then yeah, doubling the key length could be a viable solution. But also this doesn't, uh, also we haven't really touched upon quantum differential cryptanalysis, which is kind of like a pretty, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw Brandon's eyes light up right there. Like, ooh, yeah, quantum crypto differential cryptanalysis, um, its own bad boy. And that, that's actually the third algorithm that we use, I mean, showed, which was Simon's algorithm. And you can use that to find the XOR mask of some bitwise function or something. And using that, you can perform. And there's other algorithms other than Simon's algorithm, that we, uh, Simon's algorithm that we didn't entirely touch upon. But you can basically perform differential crypt analysis, it's setting up with a quantum computer, perform differential crypt analysis, and you can break a lot of um, hash codes. And, for, for your audience, Doug, um, Simon's algorithm. Okay, wait. Simon's algorithm is looking for the, the mask of an XOR hash, right? So that means if I take a bit, okay, if I take a string of bits, they're all ones and zeros, and I take another string of bits, I can like take all the ones that are the same, all the slots that are the same, and I can set them to zero, and I can take all the slots that are different in the two strings, and I can set them to one, and then I get a new bit string, and that's called XOR. Okay, so it's exclusive or, and it's basically addition, right? Because one plus one is two, but if you're talking about bits, you wrap back around. So one plus one is zero, right? Um, so XOR is essentially addition. And what this means is that Simon's algorithm can be used to uh, find a mask that is being used to hide something. Like if you have a string of bits, this XOR mask is XOR with it, and you get this new string of bits. If that mask was totally random, that new string of bits is totally random. That's information theoretically perfectly hiding. That's the definition of perfect hiding. And Simon's algorithm can go through that in square root of n times. Is that right, Adam? No, not even square. Or well, it usually it would take like n square or two to the n. I don't remember exactly, but like Simon's basically is exponentially faster than any classical algorithm. Yeah. So. so the order of shores, but that's also not even a touch upon like the Bernstein Bazarani algorithm and other similar things that like employ kind of a similar thing to Simon's algorithm. But and that's why I was actually pretty convinced that our stealth addresses were not sufficient to to hide the underlying wallet keys. But we looked at this thing in every different way, and um, th this just means that up to the 
quality of the brains in this chat right now, we can't think of anything. That doesn't mean that there's not a problem with it. So um, anyway, Simon's algorithm is, is pretty cool. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Adam. I just had to go off about that. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was a good explanation, honestly, because, uh, yeah, I don't think I really provided an adequate one. <laughs> Um, but Doug, I, I seem to have forgotten your question. No, well, we could, you were basically summarizing everything uh, from yeah. the paper. Were there any other major points to touch upon? Um, I think we hit them all. Yeah. Uh, we talked about keys. We talked about our ring signatures. We talked about, and key images. Uh, we talked about our self addresses. We talked about our transaction amount hiding problem, uh, which is going to be a fundamental problem no matter what. Uh, can you guys think of anything else that I missed? Um, we use a non-quantum secure algorithm for generating uh, transaction hashes and IDs and block hashes. Oh, I forgot about that part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's... Switch over to SHA-3, then we're good there, right? Yeah. Yeah, because right now... Um, the the way that a transaction ID is generated is basically by like hashing three different chunks um, and that becomes your like, you know, hex string. Uh, same with like how a block folds down. Those are not quantum secure currently. And there's like some little shenanigans that you could do, especially I think with the block, right? Where I could maybe find a collision where if, if there's like a real block with a given hash, I could potentially find an empty block with the same given hash. And if I propagate that around, that could cause some confusion, you know, wait, what are those outputs? That's an empty block, all that. So that was, that was I think, one of the other little things we poked into. Um, and post-quantum hash functions exist, so. Hmm. Now, I know I kind of asked this on the, on the outset, but this is a question that I know anybody that's listening, most people that are listening to always have in their back of their mind is just, you know, comparing Monero to other cryptocurrencies, comparing it mainly to Bitcoin, but obviously things like Zcash as well. So do you guys have any further thoughts there based on, you know, what we talked about these weaknesses, potential weaknesses are that you discovered in the paper uh, in, in a post-quantum world, how other... Uh, cryptocurrencies may or may not be affected. I know obviously you guys were, were studying Monero and not these others, uh, but obviously something like like Bitcoin and uh, you know whether or not uh, this is there's there's considerations to be made here as one being more secure than the other. In, in so, oh, yeah. Bitcoin. No, I'm not, I'm not going to say a bit, but the, the, yeah, Bitcoin's like quantum computers come out and Bitcoin remains the same. Like it's trash. It's done. There's already been so many other studies on this too. Like so to kind of give a more detailed answer, uh, we want to think about the security features and the privacy features. Uh, so if we start with the security features, like uh, generating a wallet address from a private key, then Monero and Bitcoin have the same issues. The exact algorithms that we described in the paper to break Monero's security can be used to break Bitcoin's security. Now, separately, let's consider the privacy features and the attack surface there. Now, because other coins don't have the privacy features, obviously they don't have the same attack surface there. And I think I can say pretty, pretty thoroughly that what happens is, yes, we have these privacy features. And if you break a Monero privacy feature, it reduces just to the Bitcoin model. So if we break ring signatures, then we just have a transaction graph that looks like Bitcoin. Uh, if we break, you know, say we were to break transaction uh, amount hiding, well, then it would just be plain text amounts like Bitcoin. So it's one of those, like, the security issues are the same and the privacy features, it just breaks Monero down to Bitcoin. Uh, it's not like Bitcoin is more secure. It just doesn't have the attack surface mm -hmm. to begin with. At least that's how I kind of view it. Well, I kind of disagree with that. Um, I, just a little bit, though. Um, so first off, the distinguish between security and privacy, uh, because the way that Mitchell did, security would be making sure that the machine works, and then privacy is making sure that the windows are tinted. Um, and so, uh, as Mitchell said, we have certain security breakdowns that are going to be common across many, many cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that everything out there right now with the 
I don't want to say everything. The vast majority of coins out there right now are totally boned if quantum computers come around. We're talking about Visa. We're talking about MasterCard. We're talking about Amazon. We're talking about um, like everything that the internet is based on is going to come crashing down. The key issue that we just described of like being able to extract a private key from a public key, that's going. that alone is, go is enough to make the entire internet wildly insecure not like every component of the internet but like you wouldn't want to be on that internet and so um the fact of the matter is is that this is not a strictly monero related issue um if you can break a monero key then you can also break a bitcoin key and vice versa as mitchell noticed i believe i that zcash's snarks are actually quantum secure um but I i'm not low is plausibly post quantum too and so like there's stuff out there that coins are currently based on that are more resistant to this problem um but the vast majority of them out there like uh other th if they're not using snarks or like winter knits one-time signatures or something like that then signatures are going to be forgeable so even if keys aren't broken then you can forge the signatures right um, but the keys are also all going to be broken because they're all using the discrete logarithm setting. Short answer is it's a cryptography apocalypse. <laughs> but if we moved, but if we move to switch commitments, then there's, there's potential. Uh, if we move to switch commitments and people keep their secret wallets secret, then there's definitely high mitigation, but I don't think it completely erases. Nope. You still have a problem because people will still be able to compute the discrete logarithm of one-time keys and then spend on your behalf without knowing your wallet. Yep. That mitigation goes away. Nuts. Wait, really? Why? Yeah. Well, if you have P as your one-time key P, you can compute yeah. the discrete logarithm P. And then without knowing the B, the view, key, the spend key or the view key, you can just use P to spend. You just use that in the ring signature. Oh, you don't even need to figure out what's behind it because you can just forge it from that. Yeah, f forgeries. Okay. Are, yeah, you wouldn't even call it a forgery because you're computing it directly from the key. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes so, sense. so even if you even if you keep money on a secret wallet, until Monero moves to a totally new key infrastructure, there's. There, there's no security. Switch commitments are an absolute last minute bailout to prevent people from uh, revealing their trans, uh, excuse me, um, to prevent people from inflating the money supply before it's too late. Uh, but they'd be able to do almost anything else except inflate the money supply. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's, All right, like, this is kind of grim call. Inspiring, right? Um, we had so many conversations about this to avoid FUD, but the thing, but, but you got to keep in mind, I'm talking about like asteroid hitting the planet here. Amazon is screwed. Visa is screwed. Mastercard is screwed. Monero being screwed is like drop in the bucket. Right. So, yeah. So switch commitments will be good temporarily. Hmm? Right. Moving to switch commitments makes sense, just so we're not secretly attacked before we all know that a quantum computer exists kind of yeah. yeah well it's it's to protect the money supply uh from undetectable inflation before it is a practical route of attack um but as soon as the money supply inflation becomes a practical route of attack with scalable quantum computers um all of these other problems crop up which mean the end of the world so that could also be why switch commitments have not been high priority at Monero. So what do you guys see as being next steps then? Uh, even with this study, are there next steps with, with the, the research itself? I'll let Mitchell and Adam answer first because I've been talking a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, I'll, I'll say it real quick and get out of the way. Is My thought is uh, start looking at switch commitments before it's too late. Uh, potentially start evaluating uh, post-quantum hash functions as well. That's potentially also just low-hanging fruit, especially if you just append the post-quantum hash to the regular hash. You're not giving up any security. You can't make it worse. You can only make it better. Uh, well, 
unless your post quantum hash is broken, but if your hash is broken, that's it, whatever. Uh, so anyways, switch commitment, post quantum hashes are the two things that to me seem like potential near term things. And then I think what we would need to do is just kind of monitor the post quantum cryptography landscape and we'll need to migrate over key generation uh, at some point if and when it looks like quantum computers are an issue. Uh, but Brandon and Adam might have different takes. I'll turn it over to <laughs> turn it over to you. Uh, me? Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, it's like I said, keeping an ear to the ground onto developments of post quantum cryptography would definitely be uh, prudent right now. We, we, we highlighted a couple of solutions right now that are available, but as Brandon said, they are not necessarily like uh, efficient enough to, you know, win over skeptics reportedly. Like, you can still technically do them. It's just like, it might be impractical on like a very large scale, or might, it might make Monero a lot more impractical, you know, even if it would be cloud coherent. So I, I'd say keep, keep the ear to the ground, um, check for updates on how po the field of post quantum cryptography is evolving. And, um, yeah, I mean, come up with prototypes and brainstorm and I mean there's a lot of work to be done I mean it, it depends on the timeline of what you're talking about for how when quantum computers will be like a real scalable serious threat publicly and it's like I don't know you, you, there's a lot of work to be done regardless even if it is just a decade. <laughs> yeah my answer would basically be Adam's answer um I know that you're supposed to like fight on podcasts and like ar disagree and argue but um uh I mean like Agreed. Sometimes, <laughs> um, so there are these two new ring signature schemes that came out that are logarithmically sized called Falafel and Calamari, um, which are great names. Um, they're both based on a novel setup using um, something called group actions, which we have an elliptic curve group, but that's not the only sort of group out there. If you just look at the integers, that's a group, so on and so forth. And a group can look, you can look at it sort of like as a Rubik's cube, or you can look at it as the motions on a Rubik's cube. And so it doesn't have to be on a Rubik's cube that you're scrambling things around. It can be any object. And that's what a group action is, which is kind of cool. Um, and they're both post quantum secure, Falafel and Calamari, and they're both tiny. Um, Raptor is a post quantum secure ring signature scheme that is so freaking fast. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but it requires certain like trapdoor assumptions and stuff. Fact of the matter is, um, sometime over the next couple of months or year or two, somebody might come up with something that is a linkable ring signature scheme that is like aggregatable. So you can just add them all up so that you only need one signature per block. Right. And uh, you might have a linkable ring signature scheme that is like sufficiently small, like fast to verify that, like, even if the block has thousands of inputs and outputs, you can evaluate that ring signature um, very, very quickly and efficiently. Right. Um, uh, but it's all still in the future. And so keeping an eye on the progress of post quantum cryptography is really like the best way that we can go for that. Awesome. All right, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.